Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, MNT Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. Affordable housing, lead development, community affairs. That's some of the businesses and the involvement of my guest today, Jonathan Rose, who is the president and CEO of Jonathan Rose Companies. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, it would be totally inappropriate if we didn't go back to the history of the Rose family. So why don't you tell me about the great-grandparents, you know, and the Brooklyn Beach Bleach Company and everything over there, of how they started. So my grandfather's grandfather came to America in about 19, somewhere between 1960 and 19, I'm sorry, 1860, 1860 and 1870, and was a successful real estate. From Poland, right? From Poland, from Meserich in Poland. And his brother, by the way, then went to Corfu and by, by way of Corfu ended up in Jerusalem. So my great, great, great grandfather ends up um, uh, developing some townhouses and real estate in Brooklyn and retires to go live with his brother in Jerusalem, live happily ever after in the Holy Land. His children do not do so well, and so my, grand, my great grandfather sends his wife and my grandfather and my great uncle Dave, who was in her belly because she was pregnant, to Jerusalem to live with their grandfather to be supported. And when he dies, then they come back. So my grandfather, Sam Rose, was actually born in the United States, went to Jerusalem, but had the immigrant experience of coming back in the early 1890s through the Port of New York, seeing the right, Statue with the of Liberty, Statue of Liberty and that whole experience. So how, when, he comes over when? So he comes over, I don't remember, the, in the eight, it's somewhere in the 1890s, early 1890s. And he's doing garments at that So time? no, at that time he's in 11 or 12 or something like that. He and his younger brother, David, do a million different businesses. They have a milk route. They are messengers. They do everything that young immigrants do to move ahead in society. And eventually, he gets into the clothing business and runs a business they called call Brooklyn. Brooklyn Better Bleach, which is bleaching ermines. And his brother, David, is in the garment business as a catalog, sales catalog buyer for um, a clothing chain. Uh, a, a catalog clothing chain. And selling jeans, no, selling jeans? No, no, that was, that, that's, the great, that, that's their father. But so, and um, they decide that they want to get in the real estate business. And so um, they, David quits his job, works for a cousin who's building buildings in the Bronx as a building superintendent, learns how the business works, 
Uh, and in the late 20s, they go into, I think 1926, they go into business for themselves. Sam is still running Brooklyn Better Bleach with partners, but puts up some money with Dave, who's also made some money, and they buy their first site in the Bronx and, and become Bronx builders, building middle-income housing. They, in uh, uh, the 1930, I believe, they build an incredible project uh, called Academy Gardens, which is a beautiful courtyard, built a whole block with a courtyard in, in the center. My Uncle Dave was very- Now, where was the Academy Gardens? In, on Academy Street in the Bronx. That's what I thought. Dave was very interested in technology and uh, energy and all the green things I'm interested in. So this building had a total energy plant, which means a cogeneration plant very early at that time. In the time. 30s. In the 30s. It was the first middle-income housing that had uh, an elevator, uh, so it was walk up six stories, but had elevators at every entryway. Uh, that's, that high electric demand is one of the reasons why they did their own generating plant. And uh, it was New York State Affordable Housing Project number one. So how do they then get to become Rose Associates, you know, with like 35,000 apartments? So uh, over time, they start building in Manhattan after, the war, after World War II. My father, Fred Rose, and his brothers, Dan and Ellie, joined the business, and the business grows just through being really smart at what they do and also having an enormous lot of integrity at what they do. Okay, so now let's focus. Let's focus a little bit about your dad. Right. Your dad grew up where? So my father was born in Brooklyn and then raised in Mount Vernon, where, the, where Sam Rose and his family had moved to. Um, joined, went, into the, went to Yale, went to the Navy. After the war, joined the family business. Um, and actually his first apartment after that was in one of our family's projects in northern Manhattan. Now, your father and his brother both went to Yale? Uh, Fred, Dan, and Ellie all went to Yale. They all went to Yale, which we'll get to when we talk about. So now let's talk about the next generation of right. bros, you. Um, you were born? So I was born in 1952 in, uh, in uh, Harrison, New York, where my family was then moving. I, they sh living, they shortly thereafter moved to Scarsdale. I was raised in Scarsdale. Um, uh, was always very interested in issues of the environment, interested in issues of social justice and um, civil rights was very active in the 1960s, uh, issues of how we create really an equitable society and loved building. And I spent a lot of my youth on weekends with my father going to- Right, with the red pencil? Go, well, I'll get to that. I spent weekends going, uh, to visit construction jobs, going to leasing offices, and he would lay plans out on the on living room floor, and I'd lie down next to him, and I'd learn from him how he'd mark up the plans. I really learned an enormous amount about not just reading plans as technically, but what are you looking for, um, and how do you make a better building? Now, you went to, uh, you went to Horace Mann? So I went to Horace Mann, uh, and then I went to Yale as an undergraduate, majored in psychology and philosophy, and then got a graduate degree at University of Pennsylvania in environmental and regional planning. Let's talk about the, the, the years at Yale and then right. the next step. What, what were you planning? You said you had psychology? So I was a combined major in psychology and philosophy. And what I was really interested in is how does the world work? What is the underlying nature of uh, biological systems, natural systems, psychological systems? How does the nature of the world work? How does the nature of human beings work? And how do we put that together to create better cities? Now, one thing, you know, if you go around the country, especially in New York City, the Rose family has done so much for the community. And one thing that you told me when we got together is that it was a requirement. Your father at that time was the head of the Federation for Jewish Philanthropies. Right. And he said to you, Jonathan, we have to find you a, an entity to get involved with, which has right. some really great changing of life on your own career. So you end up where, at the Educational Alliance? Right, so by the way, he said to me, you pick an agency, and, he sa and I was then living in a loft in the edge of Soho in Little Italy, now we're in the 1970s, so it's very early in the loft world back then, and uh, I began to work as a volunteer and board member and head of the Real Estate Committee of the Educational Alliance. Educational Alliance is the second oldest settlement house in New York City, an amazing organization that has always been on the cutting edge of social services. So it, the Education Alliance was very early in providing homeless shelters. We were then building housing for homeless uh, elderly Jews that 
We're not a recognized population. They provide housing for people with all kinds of disabilities, runaway youth, drug treatment centers, daycare centers. They developed some of the first, and maybe the first, um, uh, Head Start projects in New York City. They had several different Head Start programs, actually. And when I was there, we expanded, by the way, into lower, uh, into downtown Brooklyn, too. So it was a fantastic experience in which I really learned how the, many of the social services in cities are delivered and, um, and what the buildings that were needed to deliver them and how those buildings were financed. You graduated Yale, right. graduated Yale in 74. Right. And then you decided to go to the University of Pennsylvania. Right. For urban studies. I uh, have a master's in regional planning and environmental studies. So I was really, you know, I was, as I said, I've always been interested in both the social side and the environmental side. And there are very few master's programs at that time that looked at the environmental side of planning. So that's why I went there. And then you get your first job, your first real job. I right. mean, you had the Educational right. Alliance, you had the other things during college and everything. Well, Educational Alliance is not college. That's while right. I'm working at Rose when, Associates. When you Rose Associates. So let's talk about Rose Associates. Right. You go to work for Rose Associates, and one of the first projects that Rose Associates that you were involved right. with was something today which many people know because of Seinfeld and Larry David, right. Manhattan Plaza. Tell right. me a little bit about that and your involvement with that type of project. Right. So uh, Manhattan Plaza was being developed by Rich, Richard Ravitch and his partners and um, as a uh, Mitchell Lomba project, uh, which was then the leading affordable housing and middle income housing program in New York City. This is, this is when 42nd Street was a little, as one would say, right. Not urbanized. Uh, well, it was very, very urban, but it was not. Uh, it, it was. It was considered a sketchy area. It was considered a very questionable area. But um, uh, Manhattan Plaza is a whole city block. I think it had about a thousand apartments, and a project of that scale can change a block. And the people were in the performing right. arts. So a long, complicated history to it. But in the end, a deal is made to make it a Section Eight project, of which seventy percent of the residents are in the performing arts, fifteen percent are from the community and 15% are low-income seniors. And uh, the project, Rose Associates was the property manager of it, began the lease up. And uh, the problem was there was all this retail space. And who and wanted to be retail on 9th and 10th Avenue right. and 42nd Street in the 70s? Right, which was, uh, so nobody wanted to be in the retail. And they tried and tried and tried. So they gave the retail leasing to me because uh, it wasn't, nobody else thought it was worth their time. And they gave me a list of 40 supermarket owners and said, start calling them. We need a supermarket here. And I called this guy, and I called that guy, and then I uh, called Larry Deitch. Deitch was the owner, the president at that time of Deitch Shopwell, which is one of the leading uh, supermarket chains in New York City. It turns out that Larry Deitch really loved Broadway and the theater and had actually been writing scripts on the side. So he actually understood so the market. He was living vicariously. Right. And always, uh, you know, I'm in the supermarket business, right. but really I would love to be an actor. Right. So he actually uniquely understood the value of having a thousand performing artists there and that they were in that neighborhood. He had spent a lot of time in that neighborhood. And so he said yes. And not only did he say yes, he said, I have a whole new concept I want to uh, try here, which was uh, the, the emporium markets. And this was the, the food emporiums. And at that time in the 70s, uh, Food markets were pretty basic in New York City. That was the you had the Wahlbaums, you had the Big Apple. You right, had, but it was nothing sophisticated. Right, Ur organic foods were never heard until right. later on. So the food emporium was the first upscale food market um, in New York City, and he chose to do it at Manhattan Plaza. So it just it worked out really great. It worked out wonderfully for the Date Shopwell Company. It worked out wonderfully for uh, uh, Manhattan Plaza, and, and it was good for me too. So after that. You then get another project, um, the Sheffield, right. which, which was in an area of transition also, the corner of 57th Street and 8th Avenue, right off the corner, a building that was started that wasn't completed, and right. Rose Associate uh, takes over the ownership. Right. So that was a real trial by fire for me. I was a assistant construction superintendent, and um, I learned an enormous amount about construction. It was a very complicated project. And uh, because it was such a big building and it had a uh, 200,000 square feet of, of, of office, of office space, it had retail space, and it had 895 apartments. So uh, there was a lot going on there. And uh, I, 
I completely loved it. I loved every single day of going to work it's at that project. It's a good project. little way to learn construction, learn right. completion, everything over there. Then what happens, which is a little similar to your, your community and urbanization, it was going to Brooklyn. What happens now right. with the partnership and Kathy Weil? So by the way, I worked on some other projects for Rose Associates, but the next thing is the mayor, Koch, um, said we really need to do something about affordable housing in the city and had made a public commitment to work on that. And my father was on the board of the New York City Partnership, which had a housing group that was just getting started. And so my father said, would you represent the family and figure out what the New York City uh, partnership, Housing Partnership Program is uh, with Kathy Wilde and how can we get involved? And we began to look around for sites and we found a fantastic site in Brooklyn that so it was 26 acres that surrounded the Atlantic uh, Terminal train station. Uh, where yeah, nine Brooklyn Academy right. of Music, where you're on the board now, and right? So I was very, I was already very involved in the Brooklyn in, with the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Uh, there, I love mass transit. It makes a huge amount of environmental, social, every kind of sense. And there were nine uh, subway lines, the Long Island Railroad, and 14 bus lines that came to this site. And so we put together a master plan, one of the first transit-oriented development plans of uh, post World War II. Uh, it was, this, this, by the way, you got to remember now we're in 1984 in which companies are fleeing New That's York right. City. You know, uh, the city is uh, in deterioration over right. there. The Bronx is, uh, people were saying the right. Bronx was burning. And right. It was a difficult time. Right. So we put together a project that includes New York City partnership housing, uh, office, retail, a garage. Um, and uh, it, it, by the way, it was, one of, it was the first green project of that scale design. And nobody was thinking about green in 1984, by the way, but we had recycling built in, passive solar, a lot of green features. Um, it was a real model for what mixed use, mixed income, transit oriented development could be. The project makes it through the Board of Estimate, which was then the organization, the city agency that approves projects uh, unanimously. And we're all ready to start when two things happen, a recession hits and we get hit by four lawsuits. Uh, my family decides that uh, it's really not for them, and they sell their interest to Bruce Ratner. Um, uh, Forest City, which uh, then goes ahead and over time has developed the project. Right, but the initial thing, as opposed to the affordable housing, right. Bruce builds retail, well, Atlantic he does, Terminal. He does, and actually he sells the affordable housing piece to uh, the Hudson companies who build the affordable housing portion of the project. And uh, subsequently he builds the retail, and now... Yeah. In September, the uh, on September 28th, they open up the Barclays Center, which right. is the first thing, and hopefully the affordable housing, the construction right. will take begin in December of right. this year. So Thanks. one of the things is, by the way, I often go to the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and when I come up from the train line and and uh, from the subway up into the uh, to get out, as you come up, you come up through an atrium, a circular atrium that has a, a round roof. And I remember that, I'm always reminded of that because that was actually something that was in the Euler. So it was actually part of the, part of our, almost none of our original design got built. It all got changed, but that got locked in. So that is a vestige of the original plan that I got approved. I think of it every time I walk through it. Let's fast forward. It's 1989. Right. What happens? So in 1989, there's a recession going on. There's not much happening here. I'm seeing enormous opportunity uh, in Colorado and out in the Rockies and out west. And, um, and I decided to leave the family business and start my own company. The real key driver was that my family are the best at real estate, residential real estate, they're the best company I know. And uh, in philanthropy, my family's been extraordinary. There was a movement that was happening then of called social enterprise. The view that you could take philanthropic or, or compassionate interests and business and put the two together and make for-profit businesses um, that had a, a mission. And it's something I really wanted to do. I wanted to bring those two streams of my life together. So how do you end up in Denver? I mean, I love Denver. I have my son and gra daughter and my grandchildren there. So the first thing is there's a recession happening in New York City and there's almost no development happening in the East Coast for the next few years. And I had been doing a little project, um, I started with a little project actually in Santa Fe of Artist Live Work Studios, which we developed the first post-war live work. You know, people have been living in loss, but nobody had actually done a new building for live work. It's, it's called Second Street Studios. I did it with local partners. It's been very, very successful. And um, I just love the Rockies. I love the mountains. I just, 
It's actually, I thought as a place maybe a I was going to move to. Nothing high. I get a, I get a high by being there. And so, uh, and I could see that Denver was about to come out of the recession much earlier than the rest of the country. The fundamentals were there. The buildings, the land was incredibly cheap. And so I just sensed a lot of opportunity. So the May Company was divesting themselves of a number of their stores, and what right. happens? So uh, they had owned the prime department store in the heart of the downtown called the Denver Dry Goods Building. And that's a building that was much beloved. Whenever I meet people in Denver, they tell me their grandmother took them shopping there at Christmas and all that. The May Company wanted to tear the building down. Now, this is at their equivalent of Fifth Avenue, 57th Street, literally the heart of the downtown. And so the city bought it to prevent it from being torn down. They went through four developers who tried to redevelop, and none of them succeeded. So they were pretty desperate, frankly. And I show up as a guy with a small company from New York. We were a tiny company, actually, at that point. And I came up with a concept, and they agreed to go with it. And that was to divide this very large project into a series of pieces. And so we had uh, we divided into retail pieces, office piece, housing, a, f a uh, market rate housing piece, a affordable housing piece, and financed all those separately. It took 23 pieces of financing. Enormous coordination problems. Historical tax credits. That is historic tax credits, low income housing tax credits, three or four UDAG grants, a TIF tax increment financing. And what do you build? And we put it all together as tremendous success. It was green, by the way, so it's the first green, mixed use, mixed income, historic tax credit, transit oriented development in the country. Um, and what we built was retail in the basement ground and second floor, bringing big box retail from the suburbs back into the city. Um, there's a TJ Maxx store we put in that's still in there today. On the third floor office, um, and part of the second also, on the fourth, fifth, and sixth on half of the building, 80% uh, low income housing rental, 20% market. And on the uh, other third side of the block, fourth, fifth, and sixth, uh, market rate condos which were sold off by another developer. So at that time, the Jonathan Rose Company is basically in Katona, right. doing consulting, doing right. work, you know, doing certain projects, right. doing, doing some development in New York, but really uh, not major development. Nothing in New York. At that point, we really grew our base and our reputation and our expertise in this kind of development in Colorado. Then uh, it came to Yonkers, where I began to do affordable housing in partnership with a wonderful local not-for-profit called the Grayston Foundation. Did three buildings with them. Uh, and um, uh, a couple other products. Uh, by the way, we then also started acquiring real estate all around the country, but much in Denver and Albuquerque, and where I was seeing Santa Fe, where I was seeing really good deals. So I began to buy real estate with family and friend investors. Now, when did you get involved? Okay, did you get involved with Jazz and Lincoln Center before 2001? Yes, so uh, I actually got involved with Jazz and Lincoln Center in the mid-80s. Uh, when I was still actually at Rose Associates, Lincoln Center decided it wanted to explore whether there was a future in jazz. They wanted to diversify their audience and began a program called um, uh, Classical Jazz uh, with Wynton Marcellus, put together a committee which I was on. That committee eventually became a separate constituency and a board. And um, in the late 90s, uh, we, uh, we became the cultural element of the Time Warner Center. And I spent a great deal of my time as the board member in charge of that project, overseeing all of its design and construction. With five minutes left, let's, let's talk yeah. about 2001 and the, f and the current day. So one day, it's uh, unfortunately 9-11, right. right. you turn on the TV and you say, I'm a Katona, this is not right. for me, what happens? Well, so actually that was a day that I had realized I needed to take my company to the next level and had engaged a strategic planner who showed up that day and 9-11 was going on in the background as I was thinking, what is the next step in the growth of my company? So it was very clear to me that it was time to move back to New York City. So at a time when other people were fleeing, I come back, I sublet some space, actually in a building where Rose Associates had had his office for most of my life, and then um, uh, and began to grow a company. And, uh, so let's talk about the company. Let's right. talk about some of the great projects. I mean, let's talk about the affordable, because that's what you're right. very proud of, and let's talk about the Stanford project, right. and then let's talk about the Enterprise Zone and some, you know, the Rouse Foundation otherwise. Okay, 
So uh, our company does four things. We do planning work. So for example, we just completed a new master plan for the city of Newark. We do project management. We manage, uh, uh, wonder, we believe cities need a very healthy educational cultural infrastructure. So we just completed overseeing the development of the new signature theaters, the Bam Fisher Building, the Cooper Union's new academic building, um, several other projects. Uh, the Orchestra of St. Luke's Center for Classical Music. Um, we, uh, we do development of mixed use uh, and uh, mixed income. Let's it's talk about the tapestry in right. Boa Verde. Right. So tapestry we built with a wonderful partner named Nick Latier, who's a contractor we do a lot of work with, a project on 124th Street and 2nd Avenue, the tapestry, beautiful design, Lee Gold Building, 50-30-20, so 50% Market rate units, 30% moderate income, 20% affordable, plus some retail on the ground floor, 186 apartments. Villa Verde. Villa Verde, which we did as a 50-50 partnership with uh, Phipps Housing. We do a lot of work with different partners, with different not-for-profits. So this is a fantastic it's building. It's really the model of what the future of green affordable housing is. In the that Bronx. It's in the South Bronx, right, just near the hub. Great subway access, about 220 units. Um, uh, about two-thirds uh, rental, one-third for sale. Uh, as green as can be, probably lead platinum, but also all the roofs. It's, so the building starts tall and steps down. All the roofs uh, have uh, beautiful gardens in which people can grow vegetables. It has an amphitheater for arts and culture. We really focus in this building on human health. And so the ground floor has a, a Montefiore Hospital uh, local clinic and a pharmacy. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of your community involvement and things that are going to happen over the next couple of months personally. So uh, there's an, uh, I am a vice chairman of the board of an extraordinary organization called Enterprise Community Partners, founded by my hero, Jim Rouse, 30 years ago. Jim was a great community builder and deeply committed to affordable housing. Enterprise works with about 2,000 community groups around the country and brings over a billion dollars a year. I think it's going to be about a billion six this year of uh, low-cost financing, low-income housing tax credits, et cetera, to help community revi revitalization and the building of affordable housing. And I am very honored that on November 7th, uh, I will win the Jim Rouse Award. Wonderful honor. Let's talk about Stanford, the project right. you did with the Malkins. Right. So the, Mal the Tony Malkin came to me and said, we have a site in Stanford. We Right next to the train station. All you'll hear urban, your urban, exactly. You're hearing a theme. All of our projects, by the way, are next to mass transit. We think that's very important from an environmental side and a social equity side, access to transportation without having to pay for a car. And Tony said, I need a, we, we want to build a new office building on this site, but the zoning requires housing too, and the portion of the housing has to be affordable. We need a partner to do that. So we've been the lead partner on the developing of that. We've built, uh, so far, 100 units of uh, mostly affordable housing, mixed income housing, where uh, the next section will be 150 units of um, a mix, 50-50 affordable housing and market rate. All very, very green buildings, um, walking distance to the train station, a beautiful uh, park inside the project. Uh, it's been really wonderful with, with working with the Malkins. They've been fantastic partners. Family. Yes. Wife and the children. Um, my wife and I, about 10 years ago, co-founded something called the Garrison Institute. We were given a building, uh, a monastery on the Hudson River in Garrison, New York, where we live, and um, by the Open Space Institute. And my wife has really spent the last 10 years building this extraordinary institute that has asked, what is the monastery of the 21st century? And takes the wisdom of contemplation and applies it to issues of civil society and the environment. Ten seconds. Wife's name and the, and the and, names of the daughters. And so my wife is Deanna Rose. My uh, uh, daughters are Rachel Rose and Ariel Flores Zarovsky. One thing I would have to say, the Rose family continues with Jonathan Rose, philanthropically and as a human being and everything else. And I think you, your family, especially what you're doing today, is continue to build New York and around the country. And I'd like to thank you. And thank you so much for having me.